Good morning. Because of him, we are here to worship. It's good to have many more back out again, and hopefully more and more. It's good to have visitors with us all the way from Bristol. Good to see you, Joseph. Glad that you could make it. And uh, others are traveling, so keep them in your prayers as well. It's good to see Lisa after such a long time. Look at that smile. Even behind a mask, you can still see it. That's great to have you. We're going to worship God now. Welcome to those in Zoom and in Truth FM. And we'll be led in our first prayer at this time. If you're willing, please stand for the opening prayer this morning. Father, we are so thankful that we could be here. We feel so blessed to be in each other's company, Father, as we give ourselves to you, Father, as we worship you, as we sing your praises, as we are led around this worship service by the men here this morning, Father, we ask for your blessing. We ask that uh, as we pour out a love to you, Father, that your love could be shown to us uh, as, as we go through this worship service, Father. Father, be with us all and uh, encourage those who are in leading today. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, folks. My first song this morning is number 417, Where He Leads Me, I'll Follow. <clears throat> Sweet are the promises, kind is the word, dearer far than any message man ever heard. Pure was the mind of Christ, sinless I see. He the great example is a bottom for me. Where he a follow all the way. Where he a follow, follow Jesus every day. Sweet is a tender love, Jesus. Has shown sweeter far than any love that mortals have known. Can to the erring one, faithful is he. He, the great example, is a pattern for me. Where he leads a Good morning, brothers and sisters. The Old Testament reading is taken from the second book of Kings, chapter 22, verse 1 and 2. Reading from the NIV. Josiah was eight years old when he became king. And he reigned in Jerusalem for 31 years. His mother's name was Jedidah, the daughter of Adair. She was from Bosca. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and walked in all the ways of his father David, not turning aside to the right or to the left. God bless us all. Amen. Oh. 
one in touch. New, uh, the old New Testament reading is from Revelation chapter 6, verse 5 to 6. I'm reading from the New King James. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for uh, dinaris, and three quarts of barley for a dinaris, and do not arm the oil and the wine. Amen. Number nine, thank me. Just a little talk with Jesus. Forgive me for not wearing my mask. I forgot all about it. Anyway. I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. I fell away from heaven, drove my soul. It gave my heart to love and wrote my name of love. Just a little talk with Jesus, make me whole. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus, let us talk about our troubles. He will hear our faithless cry, and he will answer by and by. Feel a little prayerful yearning as your soul on the heaven is turning. You will find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Sometimes my past seems drear without a ray of cheer. And then it might have been brighter than the day. The mists of sin may rise and hide the starry sky. But just a little talk with Jesus clears the way. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. Let us tell us all about our troubles. Oh, hear our faintest cry, and we will answer by and by. Now, when you feel a little prayerful yearning as your heart under heaven is turning, you will find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. I may have doubts and fears, my eyes be filled with tears, but Jesus is a friend who watches day and night. I go to him in prayer, he knows my every care, and just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus, let us tell him all about our troubles, he will hear our greatest cry, and he will answer by and by. Feel a little prayerful yearning as your heart under heaven is turning. Find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Okay. Gracious and loving Father, we thank you for our brothers and sisters in Christ. I saw us such a good example of Christ-like people. But we especially want to recognise the value of our brothers at this time. We know they lead so different lives when some have families opposed to them and others have families that share their faith. There are some in workplaces that just tolerate them and others that are looked up to. We thank you that each one of them are faithful to you and spend each day shining for you, come what may. We thank you, we thank you that they step up and lead in whatever role they have given them. Whether they are the mouthpieces, the listening ear, the foot soldiers, the creative one, or the old seal. We pray that you will continue to develop and change us, that our usefulness in your kingdom will increase as we gain more talents and learn better 
Be good to others and sisters of your kingdom. When we doubt, please reassure us. When we stumble, please pick us up. So that we will be said, so it will be said of us that we have fought the fight, finished the race, and have kept the faith. We thank you for each one of them, whether in this place or across this country or the world, as we strive to be great ambassadors for you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Number 387, before we come round the Lord's table this morning. Tell me the story of Jesus, right on my heart as we walk. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever. Tell how the angels in chorus sang as they welcomed his birth. Glory to God in the highest, peace and good tidings on earth. Tell me the story of Jesus. Right on my heart, every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Fasting alone in the desert, tell of the days of our father. And for our sins he was tempted, yet was triumphant at last. Tell of the years of his labor, tell of the sorrow he bore. He was despised and afraid. Rejected and poor. Tell me the story of Jesus, right on my heart, everyone. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Tell of the cross where they nailed him, writhing in anguish and pain. Tell of the grave where they laid him. Tell how he liveth again. Clearer than ever I see. Stay, let me weep while you whisper. Love, bring a ransom for me. Tell me the story of Jesus. Right on my heart. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. One, everyone. 
Uh, we're here this morning, uh, this time of week, we use it to focus on Remember Jesus. Uh, and I was thinking the other week when Finley was baptised, uh, Graham mentioned that one side of the family is on the, the fourth generation of Christians in our family, and the other side is on the third generation. Uh, and it kind of made me think of a phrase that uh, was uh, written in a letter by Isaac Newton, uh, which is talking, this is talking about science, obviously. It says, if I had seen further, it is by standing in the shoulders of giants. And as I say, in the context of Isaac Newton's life, uh, it's a metaphor which means using understanding gained by major thinkers who have gone before in order to make intellectual progress. But it seems to be quite an important phrase. If you look at the edge of a two-pound coin, that used to be written in that, I hope it still is. Uh, but the phrase itself is origins in Greek mythology. Isaac Newton did come up with it. Uh, it's about the blind giant Orion carried uh, a, a sedalion on his shoulders to guide him. But it's also got some religious stuff. Uh, I've just checked with Emma about how you say this, it's a French guy, so it's handy having a French teacher in the house. Uh, there's a, a guy who wrote this in some like 1196 called Bernard of Chart, uh, and it appears in a stained glass window in the south uh, transept of the cathedral there. Uh, and it shows the four major prophets of the Hebrew Bible, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel, which gigantic figures, and the four New Testament evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they're ordinary sized people sitting on their shoulders. And although Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are smaller, they see more than the huge prophets since they saw the Messiah about who the prophets were talking about. But if you apply this phrase to your Christian life, eh, there's people who have helped lift eh, every one of us up, and they enable us to see Jesus more clearly. Eh, we can think of some people who might be giants in our lives, who have acted in our lives. And sometimes it's easy uh, to think of people who might have had a large impact in their lives. The obvious examples are those who take the classes and uh, preach. And in the case of Adam and Graham, they definitely are giants because I get a crick in my neck just looking up at them when I'm talking to them. Uh, however, we can think other people as well who might not have realised that what they were doing was actually affecting us uh, in our lives. They might have done things that are not described as big jobs, but they still are examples to us. Uh, one of the things I meant to ask Maureen, I walked up the stairs with her and forgot to ask her. Uh, Maureen and Jack used to pick us up in their Ford Aerostar when we first came back from Florida, me and my sister, for Bible class. But every week they also picked up Sissy and Greta. I'm getting an odd, so I must have got that right. And there's two ladies uh, who were there all the time. And again, there's an example where they're taking the opportunity to attend the church when, when it's available to them. And it shows how important it is. Or it could be the importance of fellowship. At East Coast, I used to have golf outings. Uh, I also had Adam's dad used to take me. Now, I think this only happened two or three times. I won't over-egg this. Uh, Adam and Charlie used to take me and play golf. Maybe they saw how bad my golf was and decided to ditch me. That was the other thing. Uh, but this list could go on, and it could go on for you, uh, of different people, different ways that they've strengthened and encouraged you. Uh, but it's also to say that you're probably having an effect on other people that you might not be realising. Uh, and the thing about being a Christian is that by standing on the shoulders of, giant, of giants of the Christian faith, we're not just looking forward, but first of all, we're looking to the past, we're looking back, and we're looking back at the life of Jesus to start with. The example that Jesus set for us, uh, the teachings of Jesus, we're looking at the sacrifice of Jesus and the resurrection of him. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8, Paul writes, and he basically summarizes this point, and it says, For I deliver to you as of first importance, watch, uh, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and he appeared to, appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, although some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. But we can also look forward to the future as well. And uh, Jude 20 and 21 reads, But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. So at this time, let's go to God in prayer. Uh, let's take advantage of this time that we have, away from the cares of the world, uh, to take a few quiet minutes of the week just to remember our Saviour, uh, what we've gained through him, and what we have to look forward to in the future. So let's pray this time. Heavenly Father, we pray a blessing every head bowed here this morning. Uh, we pray that you'll help us to gain strength and encouragement from being here. 
Father, help us to uh, focus on Jesus in the next few minutes. Help us to think about the meaning that he has in our lives, uh, the sacrifice that he made, the love that he had for us, uh, and the hope that we enjoy through him. In his name we pray. Amen. Let's offer thanks again. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this uh, grape juice, the symbol of your son's blood, which is spilt in that tree, uh, the blood which cleanses us free of our sins and gives us hope uh, for the future. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. I seem to get coordinates this morning for some reason. Number 833, I want to be where you are. <clears throat> I just want to be where you are. I don't want to worship
morning, everyone. This morning's sermon reading is from the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verses 12 to 21. Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the, the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come, and let him who hears say, come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come, and whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy in the, of this book. If anyone adds anything to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes words away from this book of prophecy, God will take away from him his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. Thank you, Stuart, for reading that for us. Morning, everyone. Great to see you this morning. Great to have Joseph with us. As Graham's already set up from Bristol, good to see everyone else here. There are some that are missing. All the Johnsons are away, and uh, some are, are sick. And, and let's let's be let's be honest. There are some who are still struggling. So have a look around, and uh, be in touch with someone this week. Not saying whoever's not here is struggling, but there are some. So uh, get get don't leave it for someone else. Get in touch. Get in touch with someone. I mean, as you know that as you know, I do words of the week every week, and I try and make it a I try and make a, a picture that I've taken. So I think words, I'm tempted to make words of the week this week. A picture of Ronnie wearing his mask and saying, I'm sorry I'm not wearing my mask because I forgot to bring it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I can't, I'll need to do something a wee bit more thought provoking than that. But, but that, that would be great. But anyway, thanks. That was good, Ronnie. Good um, worship with, in the songs this morning. <laughs> I know people do that with their glasses, but I've never heard somebody doing it with a mask before. That was great. Famous last words. Oh, there you go. Famous last words. General John Sedgwick said, they couldn't hit an elephant at this distance. That was his last words. He'd be saying that to his soldiers as they were ducking to avoid a Confederate sniper. And gone. Famous last words. Some of them can be humorous like this. Uh, Oscar Wilde, as he was dying in his hotel room, said, either that wallpaper goes or I do. That was the last thing he said. <laughs> Ironically, the hotel later changed the wallpaper and did it up in a way that um, was appropriate for Oscar Wilde. But anyway, just a little bit of humour to some of those famous last words. Some aren't always humorous. Some are a bit strange. Uh, Salvador, Salvador, Salvador Dali said, I do not believe, these last words were, I do not believe in my death. He does now. And even stranger, Nostradamus, who claimed to be a prophet, said, tomorrow at sunlight rise, I shall no longer be here. Well, at least he got something right. One prophecy he, he was correct in. Some are a little bit more tragic. Frank Sinatra's last words were, I'm losing it. John Belushi, as he died struggling with drugs and addiction, said, just don't leave me alone. Joan Crawford, 
as one of our nurses was praying for us, you could see one of our nurses praying for us, she said, don't you dare ask God to help me. Last words, tragic. Some are just touching. P.T. Barnum, the great circus man said, Nancy, to his wife obviously, Nancy, I want you to know my last thoughts are of you. Arthur Conan Doyle, the writer of the Sherlock Holmes novels, turned and looked at his wife on his deathbed and simply said, you are wonderful. I'm sure you've heard of most of these uh, famous people. One of the ones that I hadn't heard of, and perhaps you haven't either, is a composer, Gustav Mahler. And as Gustav Mahler lay in his deathbed, conducting an imaginary orchestra, his last words were simply Mozart. And I know that one's not as well known, but I put that one in there because it, remind, it actually reminded me of Jack. And I remember as Jack in his last hours, last moments, and he was, he was pointing and he was talking. And I remember, I remember Maureen saying to him, I wasn't there, but I remember hearing Maureen saying to him, are you preaching, Jack? And he just nodded. And then when I think of that, that reminds me of going to visit John Rennick, Jack and I, when we knew he was in his last days. And as we, we spent some time visiting with him, and as, as, as we were leaving, Jack just, and he was kind of leaning towards the edge of his bed, and Jack said, see you in the morning. We weren't going back the next day. We knew this would be the last time we would see him, and John knew what he meant. And Jack said, see you in the morning, John. And John just looked at him and thumbs up. And that reminds me of when I was at the deathbed of Marion, remember old Marion? And it was, was it her daughter's deathbed in the hospice in Strathcarran? And Marion had become a Christian years before and had fallen away. And she couldn't communicate, she couldn't talk, but she could hear, she could squeeze her hand. And I was encouraging her just, Marion, just make, make things right with God. Just be right with God. And I asked her if she wanted to pray, and, and she, she nodded, squeezed my hand, and I prayed, and when, at the end of the prayer, when I opened my eyes, there was just tears running down her face. And I like to think her last words were making things right with God. Last words. We, we listen very carefully to them. We remember them. I dare say my last words are not going to be recorded like any of those famous ones, but I would like to think that those who love me the most will be there to hear them and will remember them and we honour them, don't we? And if there's requests or instructions in there, we act upon them. Last words are important. I think if you go to Acts chapter uh, 1, verse 8, you'll, you'll have the last words of Jesus to his disciples before he ascends back to the Father. And really, we just want the, the last part of that verse 8 there. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Just the, the second part of it. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And then in verse 9, when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. Last words. You will be my witnesses, they said, he said to him. Well, they, they certainly did. They certainly listened and remembered and honoured those last words of Jesus that they heard. Go to Acts chapter 4. Let's look at a few passages here. You're going to need your Bibles this morning. We're going to be flicking uh, through quite a lot of passages. Uh, Acts chapter 4, verse 13. 
It says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished and recognized they had been with Jesus. See their boldness in preaching? Yeah, they'd been with Jesus, but I tell you what, they were acting in those last words. They were remembering those last, those last words. Look at verse 18, same chapter. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Verse 19 and 20, but Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak what we have seen and heard. We cannot but speak. We must. We must do this. There was a sense of responsibility. There was a passion there as well. But this is one of the last things Jesus had said to them. Look at verse 29, same chapter. And now, Lord, look upon their threats. This is when um, Peter and John had been released from prison and they were praying. The, the believers were praying together. And they, and they said, and in their prayer, they're saying, and now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. Honoring those last words, and you see in verse 31, they, they would receive the boldness. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Honoring those last words. Look at chapter 5, uh, verse, 23 and 20, verse 23 to 25. We found the prison securely locked. And the guards, I love this, I love this scene, found the prison securely locked and the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. The guards are at the prison doors thinking they're in the, in the jail and they're not there. Now, when the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them, wondering what this would come to. And someone came and told them, look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. <laughs> the relentlessness of them obeying, honoring, acting upon those last words of Jesus. No, no release from prison and away hiding. They're standing openly and preaching and they think, I, I, I love that. I love the relentlessness of how they honor those last words of Jesus. Look at verse... Um, 28 and 29, same passage, uh, same chapter, sorry. Saying, we strictly charged you not to teach in this name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. Look at their faithfulness. Look at verse 32. And we are witnesses. Well, that's what Jesus had said to them. You'll be my witnesses. We are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those to obey him. And one of my favorite, one of my favorite pictures in Acts chapter 17. Go there. Acts 17. I love this. Converse, not conversation, but um, just what's said. We look at verse 3. Uh, let's, let's begin verse 2. It's really the last part of verse 3 we want, but we'll begin in verse 2. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on, three, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you, proclaiming Jesus as being that witness, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ, and then you jump down to verse 6. And the last part of that verse says, when they're getting upset and they're dragging out Jason to beat him up, he says, they say, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. I love that. They've turned the world up. They're, they're, meaning, to, they're meaning to insult them. What a compliment in honoring the word of Jesus. How this how this message impacts us. Just great, uh, 
great picture of how they are honouring the last words of Jesus. Just to finish up on that point, go to Romans 10. Romans 10, 15 to 18. And how are, they, how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed they have, for their voice has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. I guess they really took those last words of Jesus just before the ascension. I guess they really took them seriously. The last words he spoke on this earth. Of course, I guess we generally think of the, the last words of Jesus as being on the cross. Technically, it was at the ascension, but we really... We really think a lot about those last words of Jesus on the cross. Go to John 19. John 19, verse 28 to 30. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. The last words of Jesus on the cross. If you go to the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and and Luke, Mark chapter 15, verse 37 through 39, will just say that he let out a loud cry. And then the centurion said, when he saw how he died, said, surely this man is the son of God. And, and Mark doesn't really tell you what the loud cry was. In Matthew 27, 50, it's kind of the same. Said that he, he cried out with a loud voice and then yielded his spirit. So you kind of ties it in with John 19 there. Still have the details of the centurion proclaiming him to be the son of God. But if you go to Luke chapter 23, it really gives the details of, um, of what that loud cry was. Luke 23, verse 46. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. There's such power in the last words of Jesus on the cross, just because of the context, just because of where he is and what he's going through and who he's doing it for. And the things that he says there have such power because of that. They make such an impact. They, they stir such emotion. You just think about it. Then, of course, we have, in another sense, the last words of Jesus. If you go to John 16, you've got, you know, as, he's, as, as those last few days before the cross, you have him gathering his disciples and um, giving, having a last talk with them, really. And he's not on his deathbed, but he's not going to be. So this is it. And if you go to John 16, uh, go, to, go to verse 12 and 13. No, in fact, uh, forget that. Go to, go to verse 22, first of all. And he says, uh, so also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again. Those kind of last words there, I will see you again. Look at verse 27, what he says to them. He says, for the Father himself loves you. Great last word. Verse 33, same chapter. He's, he's, he's asking for them to have peace. I've said these things to you, that in, you, in me you may have peace. 
And then he says to them in the same verse, take heart. I mean, there's a real last words ring to those kind of things. John 17, then he moves on and he, we, we have recorded there the last prayer before, before he's arrested. Look at verse uh, 21. First of all, that they may all be one. This is in his prayer and he's praying for his disciples and he says, that they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us. Look at verse 22. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one, even as we are one. Look at verse 23. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one. Definitely get the idea in this last prayer of Jesus that the unity of his own is a high priority. It's on his mind. He wants us to be united. And then in chapter 18, we find out how significant this last prayer was. In 1 through 5, we have him uh, being arrested. When Jesus had spoken these words, the words of his prayer, chapter 18, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often went met there with his disciples. So Judas, having poured, procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. Then you jump down to verse 12. So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. How many lessons have you heard from John 16? You know about the comfort that he gives his disciples, the promises that he makes them, the reassurances that he gives them. How many, I know for me, Graham, how many lessons have we preached from John 17 about how important the unity of the church, the unity of his own, the unity of his children, the unity of his family is to Jesus? Last words. It's kind of strange what last means in, in, in the scripture sometimes. Though. Go, to, go to 2 Peter chapter 3 as we as we just contemplate for a minute the real meaning of last in the scripture, 2 Peter chapter 3, look at verse 3 and 4. Now this isn't last words, he's talking about last days here. And it says, knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires, they will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning, beginning of creation. Now, Peter calls this, Peter's talking about the last days here, but I tell, I, I, I'm sure you'll agree with me. What he's saying about the last days kind of sounds like it's already happening. It sounds like that, that happens today. Go to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Second Timothy chapter three, first five verses. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. Last days again, there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. And he says to avoid such people. He's talking about the last days. Do you agree? This, this kind of sounds like today. He's calling it last days, but it sounds like right now. Go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. The 
Peter's already standing up. He's already started to preach. And this is what he says. And he quotes from the prophet Joel. And he says, this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And then the last days, last days again, and then the last days, it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And Peter's saying to them, this is happening right now. What Joel was prophesying about, you're about to see take place. You're, you're actually seeing it fulfilled. Last days was right back then in the day of Pentecost, just after Jesus had been crucified. Go to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, first two verses. <clears throat> Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things. Writer of Hebrews is saying, when Jesus was speaking, those were the last days. Basically, the last days are everything from Christ until now and beyond now. In other words, we're in the last days. We're actually living in the last days and we're hearing the last words spoken by the Son of God. So what does that say about, about this, these last words that we're talking about then? Go to John 16. Back to John 16. Go to, go to verse 12 and 13 now. Where I tried to take you earlier, and that was a mistake. John 16, 12 and 13. Jesus is saying in this last talk with his disciples, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. See that phrase that he uses in verse 13? Talking to his disciples, he says, the Holy Spirit is going to come and he's going to declare to you all truth. Everything you need to know, everything that I'm ever going to reveal, everything that I'm ever going to say from this point on, Holy Spirit's going to say it. Holy Spirit's going to come and reveal it to you. Go to uh, Jude, the wee, book, the wee letter of Jude just before Revelation. It's only one page, only one chapter. So look at verse 3. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Once for all. That phrase in Greek literally means once for all time. This is it. All scripture has been revealed one time for all time. There's not going to be anything new. There's no more revelations. There's no more secret messages that come. No more new stuff that comes that God thinks, well, I didn't think about that. Or, you know, it's times have changed, so here's something new to deal with it. This, this was it. All the scripture that we have here in our hands this morning, still this morning, are the famous last words of God. Not just the cross, not just the ascension, not just John 16 and 17, all of it. Almost reluctant to call them the famous last words because famous last words is a phrase that we use when you say something and then it doesn't really, it doesn't happen or, or you're proved wrong, usually embarrassingly, you know, you know, like, uh, I, I don't know, I'm trying Try, well, Ronnie, oh, forgot to bring my mask this, this morning. Famous last words. He's got his mask on his face, you know. <laughs> he was wrong about We say stuff like that. Oh, I'm, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this. And then everyone's thinking, yeah. And then we fail. 
famous last words. These are the famous last words of God, but I tell you, it, 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 not famous in that sense, because they will happen. These are true. This will take place. Let's go back to the text that Stuart read for us this morning. Let's go back to Revelation 22. Look at the, look and listen to the, the surety of, of, of what's going on in this passage. Listen to the confidence of it all. Let's just read the whole thing again, verse 12. Behold, I am coming soon. I am coming. Guaranteed. Bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright and the morning star. Listen to the, listen to the confidence of these next few verses. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty, come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. And then in verse 18, I warn, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will, there's assurance there, God will, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. Verse 19, if anyone takes away from the words of, words of the book of this prophecy, God will, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this book. He testifies to these things, says, he who testifies to these things says, surely, surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. These all have the gravity of last words the weight of last words, the seriousness of last words, just as does all of Scripture. The Bible that we have is it. It's the last words, not bits and pieces, pick and choose. This is it. These are the last words of God. Go to Matthew 24, 35. This was one of the passages that came up on the MT's video. And it's great if you want to go back and watch that again. The last words of God and listen to some of the things that he says. Some of the promises. Some of the instructions. Some of the warnings, yes. Great last words to, to live by and be comforted by. But look at Matthew 24, verse 35. Heaven and earth will pass away. But my words will not pass away away. This Bible's it. These are the last words from him. Until we meet him again face to face, we'll hear him speak again then, but until then, these are the last words. But what do we do with last words? We know. We listen. We remember. We honour them. We act on them. If, it's, if that's in the context of a loved one, then that's appropriate. And it's right. And it's respectful. But if we're talking about the last words of God, it's more than that. It's a matter of life and death. Go to Mark chapter 8, verse 38. What do we do with the last words of God? Mark chapter 8, verse 38.
For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The words of God, the last words of God ever to be revealed in these pages are connected to the fact of judgment. Judgment will take place. It is a fact. What do we do with the last words of Jesus? If we go to the ascension, yes, we should evangelize. Yes, we should reach out and teach the lost. As he said before, right before he ascended back to be with the Father. If we're talking about the last words of the cross, yes, we should absorb those words, those life-changing words, just the impact they have just because of the context and what's happening at the time. And if we go back to the last talk and the last prayer of John 16 and 17, yes, we should be comforted by those words of John 16 and challenged, especially as far as unity goes, with the last prayer. We should be conscientious about those last words of Jesus in that last prayer in John, in John 17. But God's last words are mo much more than just those three small sections or, or any other part of scripture that we might want to choose to lean on. Much more important than that. Go back to John. Go to John chapter 12 this time. John chapter 12. And look at verse 47 and 48. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. If Mark 8, 38 led us towards the fact of judgment. John 12 tells us about the standard of judgment. Depending on what you, depending on who you read, the last words of Winston Churchill apparently were, one never knows the ending. One has to die to know exactly what happens after death. I'm going to say famous last words, Mr. Churchill because you got that one spectacularly wrong, because we can know. Jesus tells us, it is these very words, these very words that I've given to you that will judge you on that day. The Bible is it. It is the map to the place. It is the keys to the gates. It is the answer to the questions, the scripture that we have in our hands. How many people will get a spot on their shoulder or a rash on their side and they will Google and scour the internet for hours to try and find out what it is and what they need to do and are they going to die and what they need, what they need to do to not die or be better or cure it. We'll scour the internet. And here we have the words of life, the last words of God on which depend, on, on which are a matter of life and death. And yet we neglect them. We don't scour them like we do to try and find some cream that will help that spot or rash that we've got. Everything depends on these words. If you're not a Christian, everything depends on what you do with these words. Everything. If you are a Christian, everything depends on what we do with these words. These are the last words of our Heavenly Father. Until we hear him say, either, depart from me, I never knew you. Or, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Famous last words. Good words.
Thank you, Adam, for that fine lesson. Let's uh, stand, if you can, and sing this with gusto. There's a call comes ringing all the restless waves send the light, send the light. There are souls to rescue, there are souls to save, send the light, send the light, send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. We have heard the Macedonian call to the send the light, send the light, and the golden offering at the cross be laid, send the light. Send the light, send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. Let us pray thy grace to everywhere. Christ-like spirit everywhere be found. Send the light, send the light, send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine forever. Not grow weary in the work of love. Send the light, send the light. Let us gather you for a crown of love. Send the light, send the light, send the light. The blessed gospel light. Let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. Be seated, please. Why do we struggle to do that sometimes? I mean, we're supposed to give. It says in Luke chapter 6, verse 38, heaven will be given unto you. Why do we struggle to give cheerfully? Why do we sometimes flinch it or be annoyed to give? Says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, each of you should give what you've decided in your hearts, not, on, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Is it because we don't understand what heaven means? It says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, But everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible, the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. We not understand that everything is God's. Everything was made through him, by him, and for him. It's not even ours. Yet he says we can have it. He says we can enjoy what he created. He says in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 24, there is nothing better for a person than to eat, drink, and enjoy his work. I have seen that even this is from God's hand. <clears throat> Yet we sometimes struggle to give back. 
give back something that's not even ours in the first place? Do we not understand what it means to give? As children of the living God, we are under obligation to see given as an act of worship. In fact, our whole life should reflect the spirit of generosity demonstrated through giving. Why? Because he gave to us first. John 3.16, the greatest verse in scripture, it rolls off our tongue like nothing. It's probably the first verse we probably um, was told to remember. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. You see, when God made everything, he, he put us in the middle and made us rules overall, but what happened? We ruined it. We messed up big time. And God had every right to destroy us, to get rid of us, to start again. But he didn't. Why? Because he loved me. Me, a mere human being, born to Paul in Felicia, Indiana, moved to Scotland, lives in East Kilbride, goes to university in Strathclyde, works part-time as a carer. Me, who am I? I'm not even noticed in university, let alone East Kilbride. I'm not even noticed in South Lanarkshire, let alone the whole of Scotland. I'm not even noticed in the United Kingdom, let alone the whole world. Yet he chose me. He noticed me. He saved me. And sometimes we forget to thank him. Sometimes we struggle to give back to him. Or we give what we have last minute. Unless I'm assuming I'm wrong. Maybe you are someone in the world. Maybe you are that great. And you have made such an impact. Maybe you are that perfect and you didn't need saving. Maybe you are a person that maybe the person you are and everything that you've made and achieved was by you, for you, was by you, to you, and for you. If that's the case, then I'm sorry. This isn't for you. I'm not speaking to you. But you see, when we forget to thank God for what he's done, that's what we're saying. When we forget to give to God, that's what we're saying. When we forget to give to others, that's what we're saying. When we don't prioritize God and put other things in front of Him and above Him, that's what we're saying. When we understand the relationship between honoring God and generosity with what He what we possess we will also discover the reality of the gracious promise towards those that honor him. If you're a child of God, you understand that generosity reflects the character of the one who knows God. God is generous. And those who are born of him will likewise be generous. And with our generosity, God blesses it and multiplies it and gives it back to us. Give, and it will be given to you a good measure. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Why would we not want to give back? It's not ours in the first place. Yet he says we can have it. He gave his son for us. And then he says, whatever we do give, he's going to times it by a hundred. Do we really need any more proof? Do we really need any more explanation as to why we need to give? And not just give, but be cheerful about giving. What is it that it's because when it comes to giving, we just think of money? But it's not, that's not all it's about. Yes, we need money in this world to live, to, to clothe, to, to eat, for shelter, to grow. And so does the church. 
We want the church to grow. We need money to maintain, fix, adapt the building that we worship our God in. But giving is about surrendering your heart to God, putting them first, and letting the rest of your life fall into place. Because when you do this, you will be more than happy to give back from what he's given to you. You'll be more than happy to give your time, your cares and efforts to your brothers and sisters. And you'll be more than happy to spread the good news to the world. For God so loved the world that he gave. What will others say about us? For Mike so loved God that he gave. For Chris loved God so much that she gave. For Nicola loved God so much that she gave. For Dick loved God so much that he gave. How much do we love our God? Let's pray. Father, we come before you just to thank you for all that you've done. Right from the beginning of time, Father, to the moment that we're in right now. Father, your grace abounds. Your mercy, your love shows all throughout our lives. Father, as we use this opportunity to give back to you, let us understand this. Open up our hearts, Father. Open up our minds, open up our pockets, Father, to give back to you all that you've given to us. Let us understand what it means to give. So that, Father, we will grow in spirit. And we will grow in number, Father. And sometimes, Father, we pray that you forgive us. Forgive us when we, when we grumble to give back. Forgive us when we forget. Forgive us when we find it difficult, when we struggle to. Because, Father, the truth is, you don't need the money. But it's about our hearts. It's about where we're laying our treasures, Father. We pray that everything that we do give, Father, you bless it. And bless it and let it flourish, Father. This is our prayer to you, through your son's name. Amen. Thank you for that. Let's stand and sing number 957, The Swallow Is Not My Home, and remain standing for a closing prayer, please, if you will. Again, thank you, Ed. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid out somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. Can't be at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't be at home in this world anymore. They're all expecting me. Savior, pardon me, and now I am withdrawn. I know you'll take me through, though I am weak and poor, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what do I do? The angels beckon me. Just up in glory land, we'll live eternally. 
Her sins on every hand have shouted victory. The song of sweetest praise came back from heaven's shore. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what do I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world Oh, she doesn't need to Let's uh, play before we play. Well, we're we'll all God. And one thing I've got to say, awesome God. We must believe that in brother and sister. We've got an awesome God. No one can take his place. Let's pray. Oh, mighty Father, we can hear this one for the praise and songs. Do that. We love you very much, Father. <coughs> And you are God. Let's pray for several people who couldn't come here this morning. It's not for their own fault, Father. And let's pray, hope we get a little bit better, Father. So, Father, I love you very much. And I hope that way, brothers and sisters, all over, I love you too, Father. In Jesus Christ, amen. amen.